Pardon me? It's a tough class. Takes its toll. <laughs> um, I uh, that came out wrong. My nine o'clock class, like no one came in till like fifteen twenty after. It was like everyone slept in. So maybe maybe people really slept in for this class. Okay, so here's what we had last time, and we created uh, a triangle class, and we created some exceptions for a triangle class, and we threw those exceptions. So. There was two kinds of exceptions that we threw. One was if the side was wrong, all right? And a side is defined as wrong is if the amount is less than one, um, because we have this as an integer. So any value less than one, you can't have a side that has a length of zero for a triangle, all right? So <clears throat> on all of the set sides, we threw an exception if the side was less than 1. Notice what we did, too, is that we connected our constructor to the set methods. So our constructor didn't set the side 1 itself or side 2 or side 3. Instead, it called the respective set methods. Now, the advantage of that is we only need to have our validation in one place. All right, we only need to have our validation in the set method. So by making these private, which I forgot to do, but I will now. By making these private, we've made the setting of the sides fairly foolproof. There's no way that by hook or by crook that you can set a side value to zero. All right? We've created one constructor and one constructor only that accepts the three arguments for each of the sides. That constructor calls the set side methods. And the set side methods have that validation in there. And we made those private. So no one can address those attributes directly. So the exception trapping goes along with setting this private. Because of the exception trapping, or because we set it private, people, other people using this class have to go through the set method to set the value of these properties. All right. So they can't just set it to any value they want. They have to call the set method. And the set methods have validation to make sure that a proper value is entered. If this changes, if we decide that we don't want a triangle to have a side of more than 1,000, we can put that in there as well. And we can prohibit people from setting that. Even a constructor doesn't set it directly, but goes through the set method. All right. That guarantees that this is always going to be caught. So this goes a long way in making this, um, this class fault tolerant and a component that can be used without someone breaking it by giving it invalid values. Okay? So it all comes together. The fact that this is private, so it can't be addressed directly. The set methods are called from the constructor. And the, construct, uh, the set methods have the exception processing to throw it. That really, really locks down this class so that you can't get a bad value into the side. We also have a validation if the class, uh, if the sum of the sides is ever, if the sum of two of the sides is ever less than the third side, that's not valid. You can't have a triangle where the sum of two sides is less than uh, the third side. Otherwise, if you had that, then the shortest distance between two points would not be a line. It would be the two-way path. So we go and we verify that, and we throw an exception based on if that possibility occurs. Now, notice I'm calling an exception in all cases. 
all right? Which means that I can trap for exception. All right. I'm going to get rid of these exceptions because those are from our previous test. Here's the problem, though. In all cases, every error is throwing the same exception, all right, which makes it difficult for us to write code to differentiate between the different kinds of exceptions that we have. All right, we could do it. We could maybe have an if statement that looked at the message in the description and try to figure it out. But it's much better if we actually had exception classes. All right? So we can make our own exception classes, and we can inherit from those exception classes just like we can, we can inherit from the exception class just like we inherit from any other class. All right? So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to inherit, we're going to make our own exceptions. And you could do this a couple different ways. I'm going to take the long way around, all right? And I'm going to make three exception types. I'm going to make a triangle exception class which inherits from the exception class. I could make that even an abstract class if I wanted. I'm then going to make a A triangle invalid side exception and a triangle invalidated invalid invalid combination of sides exception. And that's what my inheritance structure is going to be. What is the advantage of this? The advantage of this is if I define different exception types, it makes it easier for us to trap for and do different things for different kinds of exceptions. Again, we could, if we wanted to, we could create a, a code that traps for an exception and then um, looked at the exception message and tried to figure out what kind of exception was, was called. However, it's much easier, much better to actually create a different kinds of exception. So, I'm going to go up here and I'm going to make my new class. Public Abstract class, triangle exception, the other thing that is we're going to have the advantage is we can create our own properties and methods on these. So what do we know about a triangle? It has three sides, right? So I'm going to create some private variables. for integers for error side 1, error side 2, and error side 3. It absolutely needs to extend the exception class. Thank you for noticing that. I'm going to need a constructor for it, so I'm going to make a public 
triangle exception that accepts the string argument. And simply calls the the superclass and passes the argument. Actually, I'm going to add more arguments to this. Yeah, I'm just going to keep with the one. And I'm going to write set methods for these and get methods for these. So public void set side one switch. Okay, so we have our base class defined. Now, because our base class is defined as an abstract class, we can't throw one of these. So we have to make something that overrides this. Um, Fifteen and eighteen, I need to do what? Does that change the yeah, thank you. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna go and save this as triangle exception dot Java. Because, because if I was analyzing this, let's say, if I was CTO, Chief Triangle Officer, and I got an error report of all the triangles that could not be created, if it said that I could not create this triangle, I could not create this triangle, I could not create this triangle, my logical question is going to be, well, well what were the sides? Why couldn't it create this triangle? And if I get a, uh, if, if I have that as an attribute there, I can include more in the exception. So I can include more on the error report that goes out to it, or the error message. So you can show not just that you couldn't create the triangle But some properties about it, yeah. So, you know, um, maybe, maybe the time of day that it happened. So I can look at it. So you can add attributes and methods to this because we're extending that class. Still going to be an exception, but it's a special kind of exception that is going to have associated with it some data that I can look at and decide, okay, 
and give a more, more uh, I can give a more detailed report. Think of an exception as being like uh, the accident report, you know, that, that gets, you know, when, when two cars have a, a collision, right? You have an accident report that says this car was doing this, this car is doing that. The more information, you know, an exception is kind of like saying there was an accident here. The more information we can put in that accident report or that exception class, the better we might be able to deal with stuff. All right? Um, maybe we could keep, you know, in another sort of system, maybe we could keep track of who was making all these bad triangles. All right? So we could train them and say, hey, this is not how you make a triangle or whatever. The more information that you have, the better report that you can give and the better potential you have to be able to do something with that. Okay, so here's my triangle exception. I'm going to extend that. Uh, what I call it? Triangle invalid side exception extends triangle exception. Remember, I don't get a, I don't inherit a constructor, so I'm going to have to copy this instructor over. And I'm going to override the to string method. And it's going to return I get the value of side one to return in the two string method. So I can give more information about exactly what went wrong. All right. Now how do you know it was side one? Well, We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, it, yes, it does. So we'll save this, and I'm also going to save combination of sides exception. Yes, I do. Here I'm going to output all three of them.
to answer your question, I am just by convention. If it's a bad side, I'm going to put it. I'm always going to put it in side one because it really doesn't matter, right? Um, I'm being a little lazy by putting all three sides in the triangle one. If I was doing this right, I would put the one side in invalid side and the all three sides an invalid combination of sides. So let me open up this guy and let's compile. Because I did a lot of typing there without compiling. Wow, that was amazing. Now, look what I can do here in my triangle class. I'm going to be more precise about the exception I throw. All right? My constructor can throw two different kinds of exceptions, right? It can throw a tr triangle invalid side exception and throw a triangle invalid combination of sides exception. Remind me to use shorter names next time. All right. So now, if this happens, I'm going to throw an invalid combination of sides exception. But guess what? I could do this, but I want to do something with that exception object first. Okay? So I'm going to say. So, triangle invalid combination of size exception E equals new triangle invalid combination of size exception this and if I want I can even do those sets, right? So I can say E dot set side one and set it to arg1. So I'm including that additional information in the exception. Now, I'm throwing what? Well, I'm throwing that exception. So I'm creating my exception class. I'm setting the properties that I want to set, additional information, stuff that's true about triangles that isn't true in other cases, right? Other things don't have three sides, right? So side one, two, and three doesn't exist on the generic exception class, but it exists on my class. So I can set those properties so whoever catches this has those sides and can do something with them. All right, and then I throw the exception. Now, I can do a similar thing here. Triangle invalid side exception equals triangle invalid side exception. The S. Side can't be less than one. I'm only going to set 
the one side. And I throw that. Okay. And I can copy that for my other sides. All right, let's compile it again. I need to change these to throw this kind of exception now. Because they're not throwing generic exceptions, they're throwing the special kind of exception. So now, in my unit test, I can do this and then I can catch any exception that I want to. So in this case, I'm going to get the long triangle invalid combination of sides exception. So I can do this. I can have in my catch to catch that exception and do a two string, which is going to tell me additional information about that. And I could even print out the sides. if I want. Or I can catch the other kind of exception, which we don't have as of yet. I'll make a second test case for that. and output the value of the one side. Okay, so. I'll give I'll give two errors and one valid situation. So this one is going to get the one exception. This one will give the other kind of exception. And then this one will be valid. All right, let me compile it. And I can run my unit test. You always have to specify what kind of exception you're catching when you have a catch the two No, that's the thing. You would do that if it matters to you, if you want to handle them differently. All right? Because remember, before, I could do this. I could just say, in this try catch, let me add another try catch. Let me add another issue with the triangle. If I don't care what kind of problem it is, I'll just catch the exception. But if I do that, then I can't ask for side one, two, or three because I'm going to handle any exception that way. All right? So the kind
kind of exception you throw, this is the way I look at it. Throw, if you throw a specific exception, you can catch a specific exception. Or you can catch a more general exception. If you throw the general exception, there's no way you can catch it as a specific exception. Does that make sense? So here, I'm going to throw these exceptions as specifically as possible. Then, whoever calls it gets to decide. Do you care what kind of exception it is? If so, then you write code to catch that kind of exception. If not, if you're not doing anything differently and you don't really care, then just catch exception. All right? Now, in this case, if we do that, then with this, it allowed us to see the sizes individually and do it. Whereas this one, um, when we just caught the exception, we didn't have access to those size variables. All right? We did do a two string, and we saw the, the same thing. So. So even though you caught, you caught a generic exception, you still got the uh, two string that override? Exactly. Because remember, if you call a method, whoops, I had the wrong camera on. If you call a method, the, the type of, the type of object that is declared as, so if it's declared as an exception E, that limits what methods we can call. We can only call the methods defined on exception. However, if we call a two-string method, we're going to get the right one according to how it was created. Okay. All right? Now, if I did this, this will give me a compile error if I try to do this. I try to get the sides. Why does that give me a compile error? Well, a generic exception doesn't have sides associated with it. All right? Even though we know based on this as written, hey, that's the kind of exception it is, the compiler doesn't know that. And therefore, the compiler is going to complain about that. But yet, if we call something that's overwritten, it gives us the right version of that. Now, we can do even more than that, right? I could not care what kind of triangle exception it is. All right? Maybe I just want to know it's a triangle exception as opposed to a null pointer exception or a invalid string format exception or whatever. I could actually do this then. No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> No, because I'm not creating it. Remember, when something's an abstract class, that means we cannot create an instance of it. So I could, uh, I could catch a triangle exception. All right? That's legit, because I'm not creating a triangle exception. and we can output it out because we have, let's change this to an invalid one. Handles both of them that way. So we have, a, it, it, this is why, again, if you throw the exception as specifically as possible, you can choose how to handle it. And different routines, different programs might handle it different ways. It all depends on it. A batch process that I talked about last time, 
or a few times back, right? A batch process is where you have a whole group of data that you're going through, all right? And maybe it's like a nighttime job where you accumulate a bunch of transactions during the day and then you run updates, you know? That kind of thing might handle exceptions one way versus an application that has a web interface where someone is typing in values into a form and going to save something. That might handle exceptions another way. So if we throw the exception as specifically as possible, our code that handles the exception can decide how it's going to handle it. Maybe it's just going to treat every exception the exact same way, in which case all you need to do is catch the exception. Maybe it's going to handle all triangle exceptions a certain way, but other exceptions a different way, in which case you catch the triangle exception. Or maybe we want to differentiate and treat this kind of triangle exception one way, this kind of triangle exception another way, in which case we can catch the specific exceptions that get thrown. So by being more and more granular in, in the class with defining your exceptions, you can then choose how granular you want to Exactly. In other words, if we were just throwing exceptions like we were at the beginning of class today in the example, the, the example we had last Wednesday, we couldn't do different things for the different kinds of exceptions. Not easily, all right? We couldn't do that easily and treat them different ways, all right? So it's always you can take specific stuff and generalize from it. You can't take something, an exception that was generally thrown and write, easily write code to handle specific problems. All right. That, again, that, that kind of applies like to a lot of things in, in IT, right? You design databases to hold as much detail as possible. Does that mean you always want to see all that detail? No, but you can take detail and summarize it. You can't take summarized detail and break it down into individual pieces of it. So if I held, if I stored every single sales that someone had over the month, I could summarize that to a monthly total. But if I stole, if I stole, <laughs> if I stored a monthly total, I couldn't break that down into each individual sale. All right. For the exercise that you did today, did you want this done again? It's your choice how to handle it. Yeah, it's your choice how to handle it. But you'll expect some kind of exception handling? There should be some exception handling in it, yeah, if I, if I remember right. Okay, now, interfaces and exceptions are going to come into play a lot when we get into our next topic, which is GUIs. All right? So finally we get to write a GUI. And maybe this will allow you to see why we waited till this point in the semester to write GUIs, right? Because you kind of have to understand a lot of stuff before you can write GUIs. So we make our unit tests, and again, it drives everyone crazy because you're hard coding stuff. And you've probably been told since your first programming class, don't hard code stuff, right? Well, now we're able to write a GUI to do that. So I'm going to start off, we're going to start off looking at a simple GUI. And we're going to build on it. Let me put all these guys in an exceptions folder. I'm going to grab my GUI folder. All right, CD desktop. All right, we have our first GUI, Java, and our first GUI class. So we compiled the Java source file to come up with that. So now I'm going to run it. It's going to be very underwhelming, very bare bones. 
And what it is, is it's going to allow us to enter a temperature in centigrade and convert it to Fahrenheit. So I type in 100 degrees centigrade, which should be what? 212. 100 degrees centigrade equals 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Zero degrees centigrade should be what? 32. Negative 40 centigrade should be what? Negative 40. Those are the three to always test, because negative 40 is the same in both centigrade and, and Fahrenheit. Well, if I type garbage in here, I get a message that says invalid input. All right? So, now that we know how this works, let's look at the code that handles this. All right, we import some classes here. All right. Um, there are two groups of classes that are often used in Java GUI. And they're Java Swing classes and Java AWT classes. So I think AWE was first, then Swing developed. There's also Java FX, which is used for user interfaces too, but just a set of classes. These are framework. They're building blocks that allow you to build a GUI so you don't have to write all the code yourself. So my first GUI is a class, public class. It extends JFrame. JFrame is a framework for creating uh, essentially a Java GUI window. And it implements Action Listener. All right? You're going to see the term listener a lot with GUIs. A listener is a piece of code that listens, that waits for some event to happen, and then deals with it. So what do you think is our listener? How would you describe what our listener does in this case? Right. The listener is associated with the button. All right. Because when I type something in here, nothing code-wise happens. All right. It doesn't do the calculation. I could make it so it did the calculation, but that's not how I wrote this example. Instead, there's a listener. There's a piece of code that's waiting for that button to be clicked. And when that button is clicked, it goes and does its thing. Click the button, that's the event. The listener detects that I clicked the button and does a calculation or whatever else it's going to do. Now look at the syntax here. This implements, this class, first GUI, implements action listener. All right? Action listener is listening for an action, listening for an event would be another way to say it. When we implement <coughs> an interface, that means we're promising to have some function in the class that's doing the implementing. Let's look at a Java, let's look and see what is in a Java action listener. Java action listener. is an interface, only has one method, action performed. All right, it's void, and it accepts an argument called action event E. All right, we're not going to worry about that argument right this minute. Action event E is sort of like an exception, right? An exception says that something happened and gives details of what happened. An exception, though, is like something wrong that happened. An event isn't just something wrong that happened, but that object E is sort of a report about, hey, what just happened? What action happened? So when I say this code 
implements action listener, it means that this class, first GUI, better have an action perform method. Oh, and there it is. All right. So if I did not have action performed, let me change the let me change the name of the function to action got performed from action performed. I'm going to get a compile error. Why? Because I promised that this class was going to implement action listener. That means it needs to have the method called action perform that accepts an action event. And it doesn't. So I need that method in there. If I put that back in, lo and behold, It'll compile cleanly. What we're doing here is we're creating stuff that's going to get added to our frame. We define them. We have a label. We have a text field. We have a button. And we have another label. Those are all the controls that are going to go in that GUI. We add them to our frame, and then we're good to go. We assign this object to be the object that handles the clicking of the button. BTN convert is the button. And we add an action listener of this object. So this very object, this first GUI class, is going to handle the clicking of that button. And therefore, this code is going to happen. And what this code does is it essentially grabs the value from the text box, does the math. If there was something invalid, this will give me an error, and I'll get my exception handling. Now, I'm going through this real fast because we're at the end of class. But I did want to explore the notion of an action listener and having an interface that implements the action listener. What that's saying, simply put, is this one class is my GUI that contains everything and the code that handles when the user clicks on the button. So that's sort of the lesson from the day. One thing I did want to mention, if I can come back just to wrap up the exception processing again, is one thing to keep in mind when you have code wrapped up in a try-catch block, it can't be seen out of any, any variables declared inside the try-catch block are not available outside of the try-catch block. That's how I can say triangle t equals new triangle six times, right? Because this triangle t is actually a different class than this triangle t. And outside of this try-catch block, if I put some code here, Trying to do something with triangle T, it's not going to work because it was declared inside of the try catch block. All right? Notice here, where I create my doubles, I create them before the try catch block, which means they're available inside the try catch block, but also outside of the try catch block. All right, this is where we'll pick up next time. I have two examples that essentially do the, new, the same thing, but the second one handles the listener in a different way than the first. And we'll explore some of the different ways that you can handle the listener. All right, we'll see you up in lab.